Hi there, and welcome to the show. If my last book review wasn't a huge indication, I am a big fan of Star Trek, but despite that, I haven't really sought out any of the other myriad things that Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, worked on before or after. I've never really seen any of the Lieutenant, I don't really like Westerns, so I haven't seen Have Gun Will Travel, and I've never seen his sci-fi projects that he worked on in between the original Star Trek and the movies, like Genesis 2 or Planet Earth. But there was one project that drew my attention recently, although ironically not because of Gene Roddenberry's involvement, nor the involvement of other notable Star Trek Gene, Gene L. Kuhn, longtime Trek writer and showrunner whose ideas made up the bulk of the most memorable elements of the series, creating the Klingons, Khan, the Horta, and Zephram Cochran, among many, many others. No, the reason I was introduced to today's film was because of, like many things in my life, M.A.S.H. Namely that I was introduced to it by Just Call Me Mike, the memoir of Mike Farrell, who played B.J. Honeycutt, with today's film, the Quester tapes being one of the last projects he did before he got his role on M.A.S.H. And as a Star Trek fan, there are a lot of familiar elements, because if there was one thing above all else that Gene Roddenberry was good at, it was reworking a failed project. The Cage became the Menagerie, Planet of the Titans became Phase 2, which became the motion picture and some aspects of early Next Generation, as did the Quester tapes, which is about an android with a presumed dead creator learning about humanity and seeking out his creator, which I'm sure you can figure out where those elements ended up, but... In case you can't, let's take a look at this long-forgotten Roddenberry project and see a glimpse into what could have been for TV's most iconic, big-footed, cheesy mustache-wearing meatball surgeon. This is the Quester Tapes. And God said, let there be 70s cheese. And there was. The movie opens after a very 70s intro sequence at Project Quester, as Agent Darrow, played by John Vernon, arrives to observe the work being done by the scientists, including Jerry Robinson, played by Farrell. We meet the scientists in the midst of the greatest human endeavor, the creation of life-sized operation. Bzzz, you hit the egg. No, of course, what they're actually working on is an android. What quickly becomes apparent by the conversation between Darrow and Mr. Takagi is that no one working on the project seems to know how it works as they finish up assembly. Exactly how the eye mechanism works is still guesswork. They begin testing the autonomic functions, and they seem to work properly, as Jerry works with two other scientists, Dr. Michaels and Dr. Bradley. You know, she does a good job, all right. It's... Just that I can't get used to having a woman in the operating lab. No offense, Dr. Bradley. You're different, of course. When we finally get to see the androids fully... <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that's not what they're going with, right? That's not what they're really going with. <laughs> it looks like a giant baby doll. No, 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 wait. I, I shouldn't be judgmental. It's it's just that I'm surprised. I knew this movie was going to feature similarities to a beloved Star Trek character. I just had no idea that that character was going to be Constable Odo. When they get to the programming stage, Jerry has objections and raises them. I'm sorry, I think you're wrong to use your programming instead of Dr. Veslovic's. Veslovic was very clear. Quester can only be run on Linux. Unfortunately, Darrow and the other scientists don't agree. Their opinion is more like... I'll give a what you think, Jerry? The scientists have created a programming tape to give the android a general background of knowledge using data from the university because Vaslovic's own tape, the titular Quester tape, got half erased by the project's cryptographers because they tried to decode it. But it seems to be a moot point anyway because the university tape doesn't seem to work, so they're forced to use the half erased tape anyway. My god, they did it! He's... He's dancing! The tape worked! Actually, it didn't, although based on all tests of the initial components, it should work. But that's not quite good enough for either Jerry or Darrow. Jerry is morose, and Darrow believes that Jerry, who was Vaslovic's protege before his untimely disappearance and possible death, is working to sabotage the project. We have a billion dollar pile of junk. Now what are you doing about it? Are you suggesting that someone is preventing the android from functioning? I am suggesting that. And I think I know who sabotaged the project. Robot House! 
However, unbeknownst to either of them, the android Quester awakens once everyone has left the lab and breaks free of his restraints. And while Darrow harangues both the team of scientists for the android's issues, and accuses Jerry of being a communist, I mean, saboteur, to take the android, who is programmed to only follow orders from either Veslovic and Jerry to Veslovic, who might still be alive, Quester begins using molding devices and the university's records of cosmetology to mold himself into the image of a human. And I love how the face molders just look like they're removing the makeup. Behold, the perfect human specimen! As Darrow keeps Jerry under lock and key, confined to his quarters, Quester goes on the prowl. After stealing some clothes, ending up in the Vaslovic Records Department, and does some reading about his creator, aided by some half-baked information from the half-erased tape, running into Vaslovic's secretary. Was he known to enjoy aquatic vehicles? Of course, Dr. Vaslovic went missing while on a three-hour tour. A three-hour tour! Eventually, Quester realizes that he isn't equipped to navigate the world alone and turns to his only ally, Jerry, breaking into his quarters. Oh hey, I didn't know Quester was a bending unit. Unfortunately, he chooses to recruit Jerry in the absolute worst way. Uh, Quester, just a suggestion, but perhaps you might have tried saying, Jerry, very quietly, and then in increasing volumes. Or maybe, like, tapped his shoulder a bit? Grabbing the mouth is a bit much, is all I'm saying. The early Sung models weren't very bright, although I hear there's an opening at Starfleet for Quester as an admiral. Jerry is naturally pretty concerned, doubly so when Quester takes out his guard. Oh, look out! Ah, the classic Bugs Bunny technique. Thankfully, Quester has some sense and introduces himself and explains the situation to Jerry. I must leave immediately for a metropolitan complex known as London, and it is essential that you accompany me. With no other choice but to sit around until Darrow finds out that someone took out his guard, Jerry drives Quester to the airport. This is ridiculous. I will not argue with a machine. Ah, that's what you say now, Jerry. But just wait. In 40 years, you'll be arguing with a machine trying to convince it that you're not a machine. Now that's ridiculous. They get to the airport, and Jerry has second thoughts, intending to leave Quester to his own devices. But after that display with the security guard, Jerry realizes that someone has to help Quester navigate. And unfortunately, he's the best man for the job. I can almost understand what's driving you. We humans spend a lot of time sort of seeking our creator, too. But uh, you cannot commit immoral acts in doing it. You know, Mike Farrell is incredibly well-suited to providing the voice of reason to an actor who would later play a senator on the West Wing. That man is crazy. That doesn't make this right. I know, I know. That was a reex, but come on. You didn't think I wasn't going to make a MASH reference, did you? During the trip, Jerry notes the similarities between humans and androids. And I admit, I'm a little concerned, because Jerry's wearing a turtleneck. And we all saw how well turtlenecks worked out the last time I reviewed a 70s film with an actor from MASH in it. Miss, may I have a martini, please? as large as regulations permit. Oh, hey, I didn't even have to make the MASH reference. The movie's doing them for me. I just hope that the martini is a very dry, arid, barren, desiccated, veritable dust bowl of a martini. I hope it's a martini that could be declared a disaster area. I hope she mixes Jerry just such a martini. Okay, okay, I promise I'll cool it with the mass jokes from here on out. Darrow is incensed that Quester has escaped, and puts out an APB to be on the lookout for two normal-looking men carrying no luggage or identification. Jerry and Quester are detained in airport jail at Heathrow, but Quester makes short work of the door. Uh, Quester? I think the door opens from the other side. The two of them manage to sneak out fairly easily because security is much more worried about their missing Concord jet and that mysterious blue box that showed up in Terminal 3. Quester notices that the duo is being tailed, and Quester insists that he and Jerry part ways, since Quester just needed the lift to the airport and the money for the ticket, but Jerry decides to stick around just in case. They sneak into a casino after getting confronted by a Bobby, but they escape using the genius tactic of... Running away at a brisk jog. You there! Hold where you are! 
Blast it all! I can't catch up to them. They're nearly a block away. I'll never catch up now. Quester decides to finance their endeavors by playing craps, Quester being able to throw the dice in specific ways to get a desired roll. This scene may play very familiar to anyone familiar with Star Trek. In fact, Quester himself should seem familiar. I didn't want to bog it down too much in the beginning, but Quester is very clearly a proto-data. Same personality, similar mannerisms, even down to the various head tilts. And this scene's concept was reused pretty heavily in the Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2 episode, The Royale. Initially written by Tracy Torme, the future creator of Sliders, but was heavily written by Maurice Hurley, who was pretty chummy with Gene Roddenberry, so it doesn't surprise me that one of Roddenberry's older projects would get such a callback from Hurley. And if you think it's just a coincidence that an android gambler is such a sci-fi premise that maybe Torme came up with it, Nah, because look at this. I believe their final resting position would be to repair them. I believe so. These cubes are different, but I will reshape them. Coincidence? Maybe, but I think not. Anyway, they win a bunch of money and get out of there before the pit boss breaks their legs. Their next destination is the House of the Sea, who is a link in the chain of locating Vaslovic, having many connections in the realm of international information trade. C turns out to be Lady Helena Trimble, named after perhaps the most famous Star Trek fan ever, B. Joe Trimble, and woman responsible for not only the letter-writing campaign that secured the original series' third season, but also the letter-writing campaign uh, that convinced NASA to name the first space shuttle orbiter Enterprise. Not relevant to the film, but very interesting to me, and I've really been into space stuff lately, so I figured I'd share it. Anyway, Jerry is concerned because of the reputation that Lady Helena has as a courtesan, and Lady Helena claims to not know anything about what Quester is talking about. However, Lady Helena allows him to stay the night after discovering they're being sought by the police. As Jerry and Quester discuss how they can possibly get the information they need out of Lady Helena, with Quester suggesting that Jerry attempt to initiate a sexual relationship, given her reputation, the two also hit upon the fact that, while they hadn't realized it, they've become friends in the short time they've known each other. Is it permissible to refer to you as... my friend? You referred to me in that way earlier? After a nice dinner, Quester steps aside to let Jerry put the moves on Lady Helena. You will excuse me, I have matters which require attention. And I'm sure you will enjoy the company of Mr. Robinson, who is a most exceptional human male. In very overt terms, subtlety, thy name is not Quester. They get to know each other a little bit, but Jerry can't go through with it and heads back to his room. Lady Helena meets with Quester, who details his intended plan, to which Lady Helena reveals that Jerry didn't go through with the sex. Is it your intention now to begin where he left off? If vital to an exchange of information, I am fully functional. And that's another line that was reused in early TNG, this time in The Naked Now. You are fully functional, aren't you? Of course, but... How fully? In every way, of course. Lady Helena, realizing how on the level Jerry and Quester are, agrees to negotiate for the information, and Quester offers his friendship to Lady Helena in exchange for what he needs, which she agrees to. Jerry wakes up the following morning to find Quester missing, last seen with Lady Helena, which of course has certain implications, but he's quickly set straight. Lady Helena brings Jerry down to a secret room built by Vaslovic that allows Quester to interface with worldwide telecommunications from every major government body in the world, from Washington, D.C. to the Soviet Union and beyond. Unfortunately, Quester still doesn't understand what it all means, though Jerry worries it might be for a nefarious purpose, which leads Jerry to give Darrow a call. Meanwhile, Quester realizes that his time is nearly up, with no sign of his creator, a failsafe is about to activate, causing his nuclear core to explode so that Quester's technology can't be misused, so Quester intends to find a quiet, uninhabited place to explode while lamenting the fact he barely had a chance to experience life and discover humanity's secrets. Lady Helena tries to talk Jerry down, explaining that Vaslovic's tech wasn't meant to control the world or take it over, but to save it. One life at a time. 
Jerry finds out from Helena's butler that Quester left and rushes after him, finding him sitting in a park in a nearby village. It seems dangerous, given the method of his destruction, but I guess he still has a few days left, so a little stopping to smell the roses is okay. And it's actually pretty fortunate, because in that park is a structure based on Noah's Ark, which triggers Quester's memory circuits. The boat that he's been looking for, why he keeps mentioning boats in reference to Vaslovic, wasn't a boat after all. It was an ark. An ark in space. And Quester knows where it is. Unfortunately, because of his earlier trepidation, Jerry's called a darrow resulted in several soldiers closing in on them, and in the scuffle, as Jerry tries to distract them so Quester can escape, Quester is shot. Stop him! <laughs> Back at the lab, Jerry repairs Quester, forcing Darrow to agree to his term, since Jerry is the most skilled, but Jerry has to compromise with Darrow, too, agreeing to put a tracking device into him so Darrow can follow them wherever Quester is being sent. Jerry doesn't want to do it, but given the alternative, which is letting Quester go Chernobyl, Jerry relents. They head off to a location in a place that looks like the quarry where they filmed Power Rangers, and after a lot of walking, they go into a cave at Mount Ararat with Darrow and the military hot on their tails. Darrow follows them in, and both Jerry and Darrow learn the big reveal after the computers remove the failsafe from Quester's programming. The big reveal is Vaslovic himself, who turns out to not be a brilliant scientist, but another android, created by a sufficiently advanced race to aid humanity on its way like Gary Seven, who always construct their own replacement when the time comes, but because of the rapid development of nuclear technology in the 20th century, Veslovic was damaged by the nuclear energy and began to deteriorate much earlier, resulting in him having less time to construct his replacement, thus why Quester was left in the hands of the project instead of being finished by Veslovic himself. We protect, but we do not interfere. Man must make his own way. We guide him, but always without his knowledge. Quester is also intended to be the final android, believing that after his 200-year lifespan, humanity will have outgrown its infancy. The only wrinkle is Quester's lack of knowledge of humanity, which he chooses Jerry to provide for him, and Jerry agrees. With that revelation, Darrow finally cools off, but unfortunately, Darrow riled up the military and the world government so much that he can't just walk out there and tell them that Quester's on the up-and-up and they should help him, nor does he believe that humanity deserves Quester's protection. But Quester disagrees, though, and Darrow chooses to take the tracking device, which Quester removed, and go off in their plane, allowing the military to shoot it down, killing Darrow, but making them believe that Quester has been destroyed in order to allow Quester co to continue his mission unbothered. But as Quester recognizes, now that the military powers know that an android is possible, I may not believe I'm destroyed. And the duo of Quester and Jerry go off to complete their mission to aid humanity as the movie ends. And that was the Quester tapes, a pretty decent film when all is said and done. I'm not sure I understand the motivation of the bad guys outside of generic government wants control of advanced science, and the plot is a tad convoluted, why does Quester blow up before making his way to his creator, if his creator knew he wasn't long for this world? What if he showed up after Vaslovic died? What then? Would that cave still work? Sure, he had no way of knowing that the humans would box the tape, but if he was so smart to plan for every eventuality, why not that one? But I can look past those minor nitpicks, and I definitely had a lot of fun watching the movie. It's 70s cheese, but it's glorious 70s cheese. The actors all put in a great performance. Farrell is great as the heart of the film, and Jerry is very likable. Foxworth plays Quester almost as well as Brent Spiner plays Data. In fact, I actually would say perhaps even better, because there's a certain element of inhumanity that comes across, even though Quester appears fully human human, as opposed to Data, who always looked artificial thanks to the pale skin and yellow eyes. John Vernon as Darrow is a fine villain, but I don't know if it's necessarily the writing, the acting, or the fact that I just expect Vernon to be a villain because he played an awful lot of them over his career. Dana Winter does a fine job as Lady Trimble, but nothing too spectacular, as do the rest of the cast. But special recognition must go to Walter Koenig for being absolutely unrecognizable in his Blink and You'll Miss It cameo as Darrow's assistant. Robinson's academic records. Yeah. And they want a personality profile on him. 
Try Washington. Speaking of Star Trek cameos, there are a lot of connections scattered throughout, although ironically, Quester did them all first, so technically, when Trek did them, they were making Quester references instead of the other way around. Emil Veslovic would later go on to be used as an alias for the immortal being Flint in the Star Trek novel verse and was sought by Data in the hopes of reactivating Lol after his own resurrection in the Cold Equations trilogy. In addition, there's the casino scene, which was, as I said, pretty much copied verbatim in the Royale. Plus, the idea of another species, this one of robots shaping humanity, was used in Assignment Earth and Paradise Syndrome during TOS and then reused in TNG to an extent with the ancient humanoids that seeded the galaxy in the chase, though after Roddenberry's death. Not to mention the fact that Quester is... Like I said, I've got nitpicks, but that's to be expected when this was meant as a pilot for a full TV series, so any kinks would have been worked out by the time the series got going, much like any Star Trek show. But why didn't we ever get a full set of the Quester tapes? Well, the film was very well received, but the network wanted to make a major change when the show went to series. Namely, cutting out Jerry Robinson's character, since according to Farrell, the studio felt that Quester would be in more jeopardy while on the run from the bad guys if Jerry wasn't there to help him out. As a writer myself, I find that to be a ridiculous idea. A solitary hero, especially a robot, learning about humanity would not be nearly as interesting if he was wandering around talking to himself or dealing with guest stars that need to be brought up to speed every episode. That's how you get clunky exposition. It's also why Doctor Who always has a modern-day human companion. And it seems that I'm not the only one who is vehemently opposed to removing Jerry from the equation, as Gene Roddenberry felt the exact same way and refused to continue the series under those restrictions. And while I'm glad that's how it shook out because Farrell went on to a much more beloved role on MASH, I'm also sad because network meddling is what kills so many brilliant shows in the name of marketability. And as for Foxworth, he went on to star in Falcon Crest and later did a few guest spots in Star Trek on both Deep Space Nine as Admiral Layton and Enterprise as Velas. Never did play an android, though. As for Roddenberry, as we all know, he continued working on other things until Star Trek The Motion Picture came up, and then The Next Generation, and then he worked on other projects after getting kicked upstairs as the new guard, Berman, Braga, and Pillar took over the legacy of Star Trek, with many unfinished projects and ideas seeing the light of day after his 1991 death. And as for Kuhn, who is regarded as an unsung hero of Star Trek and went largely unrecognized in his time, since Star Trek's major resurgence was still a ways away, and Roddenberry would unfortunately neglect to give Kuhn the deserved credit for his creations during his time on the lecture convention circuit, taking credit for a lot of the elements of Star Trek that Kuhn helped create. The Quester tapes would, in fact, be the final collaboration between the two genes, Roddenberry and Kuhn, although not out of any bad blood between the two, since Kuhn unfortunately passed away following a very sudden and short battle with throat and lung cancer before the pilot even aired. And it's a shame, because it's a pretty decent movie. Now, I know I have a high tolerance for cheese, and trust me, there is a lot of it in this movie, but I think it speaks to the strengths of both genes, and any problems would have likely been ironed out before it went to series, like the original Star Trek pilots both did, having their kinks worked out in successive versions. And I don't know this for sure because there's very limited information, but knowing Gene Roddenberry and knowing Star Trek, I imagine that a lot of the really interesting elements are probably Gene Roddenberry's ideas, but I imagine most of the writing the dialogue and a lot of the story elements were probably the result of Gene L. Kuhn ironing out Gene's ideas and running with them in an interesting direction, as he did so many times on the original series. Gene Roddenberry, much like other visionaries responsible for creating well-known sci-fi franchises, was very much an idea man, and he was not great in following through on the execution, as is evidenced by the projects that he had sole control over, like the original Star Trek pilot. So while he was responsible for creating what is arguably one of the most iconic and biggest hits in television history, that reputation is very much reliant on the work that others put in. 
like the actors involved, like Shatner and Nimoy and the rest of the original cast, and writers like DC Fontana, Robert Justman, and of course, Gene L. Coon. <laughs> Thank you.